guess who's getting married in the morning? Boomers in half an hour on BBC One. I have some strong language as we grab those headlines for a giggle. To have I got news for you? I'm Joe Brand. In the news this week, as footage emerges from the recent royal tour, it appears Nicholas Witchell picked the wrong moment to bend over and tie his shoelaces. <laughs> in his last year in office, there are suspicions that Barack Obama is frittering away Secret Service resources as extra protection is laid on for Tiddles, the White House cat. <laughs> and after a long day's recording, there's a sense of deja vu for the producers of Top Gear as they fail to provide Chris Evans with a steak. <laughs> no wonder he's angry, he's got pixelated organs. <laughs> <laughs> On Ian's team tonight is an actress and comedian whose Twitter biography refers to her as a northern powerhouse, presumably because George Osborne has no idea where she is and has never given her any money. <laughs> Please welcome Diane Morgan. <laughs> and with Paul tonight is a business consultant and host of Countdown who once described me as his celebrity crush. Only have I sat on you, mate. <laughs> uh, please welcome Nick Hewer. <laughs> and we start with the biggest stories of the week. Paul and Nick, yeah. take a look at this. Ah, uh, yes, the collapse of British home stores, a very famous name on the high street. Uh, that's the funeral collection there. Um, <laughs> Baboon, um, he's the new chairman, he's coming in. That's uh, Sir Philip Green and money rushing in. So, yes, there's a bit of controversy about uh, BHS and Tiffany Green. It's a hell of a story. It's a bonfire of the vanities, an extraordinary, terrible story. Um, he's not a spiv. He's not a spiv. He's not a spiv. I know he's not a spiv. My lawyer said he's not a spiv. <laughs> and you'll remember, he's had his run-ins in the city before. Um, I don't know I'm why you're planting this on me. <laughs> if you're... you want to suggest Sir Philip Greed, Green, Green... <laughs> <laughs> if you want to suggest there's something fishy about his whole financial thing, well, you say it, not me. I'm not going to say it. Your, boys, be your <laughs> boys on Private Eye will be all over it like a cheap suit, although perhaps not one from BHS. <laughs> Let's just do figures quickly, shall we? Yeah. So he bought it for 200 million. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, fair play to him. It made a profit of around 500 million in less than a decade. But he also took out around 580 million in dividends and various deals for himself and his family. Which is quite a lot to give yourself mm. in a tax haven. Mm. Again, I'm not saying that's odd. <laughs> <laughs> I've shoplifted in BHS, <laughs> but it was never. <laughs> The flip side of taking all this money out is that the reason it's gone bankrupt is there is there's a 570 million pound pension fund and someone's got to pay the pensions to these employees. Now you'd think that might be someone who'd taken 400 million out himself. But no, it's another body called the Pension Protection Fund which is backed by all oh, the taxpayer. Oh, you're happy now, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> Chest shutting down is a bit like when, when someone tells you that someone's died, but you thought they'd died earlier anyway. It's a bit like Woolworths when that went bust, you know. People were genuinely sad because they didn't know where to get the pick and mix. <laughs> no, that was a big issue for me. <laughs> In all seriousness, my concern is that this little episode 
damages the whole idea of entrepreneurship because entrepreneurs are meant to create money, mm. spread it around. This is all apparently rocketing to the south of France. Are you suggesting Monte this is more like asset stripping? No. I, I wouldn't use that phrase. <laughs> And what, what about the stuff in it? Is that good? I don't go to the edges. <laughs> One thing that's weird about Philip Green, why I find it weird, is that um, celebrities find him irresistible, don't they? How much did he spend on his birthday party? Something like five million pounds. And everyone was there, but they were there because they'd been paid. <laughs> Which the rest of us would consider, yes, tragic. <laughs> I got away with 200 quid for mine. <laughs> um, well, let, let's have a look at him with some beautiful people. Yeah, Here's a beautiful slaves. person, Liz Hurley, of course. Here's another beautiful person, yeah, Rita Ora, and another beautiful person. Yeah. Um, and listen, here's uh, Sir Philip Green with another beauty. Oh. <laughs> but you are a long way away. <laughs> Where did you find that? It's in my personal collection. <laughs> It's a specialist website. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone know what the boss of M&S uh, said about him after his failed takeover of M&S in 2004? Mm. They came to blows almost in um, outside the Dorchester, you know, during that. How during posh that, of uh, them! <laughs> <laughs> Not outside Kentucky Fried Chicken. <laughs> <though>. <laughs> He said, this is a victory for polite, calm and diplomatic people against irrational, erratic, rude, crude, volatile and offensive people. <laughs> right. And what's going to happen next? Does the uh, Parliamentary Committee have the power to coerce him to come and sit before them and answer the questions? And apparently the answer is yes, because they're also talking about bringing uh, Lady Christina. After all, she owns it. Yes. Now, Frank Field seems to think that he will be um, summoned to the uh, Commons Work and Pensions Committee. Let's, let's have a look at him telling us about that. It's inconceivable that we wouldn't actually invite um, uh, uh, Sir Philip Green to come. Um, he's called us a, a load of effing arseholes. <laughs> I mean, that's the height of arrogance, isn't it? Really? Mm. This is the demise of BHS and Sir Philip Green's battle to hold on to his title. Philip Green likes to surround himself with celebrities like Kate Moss, although it's less well known that Sir Philip has done a bit of modelling himself. <laughs> and here's what he was modelling for. <laughs> In 2010, David Cameron personally appointed Sir Philip Green as the government efficiencies are. Uh, 2010, the same year, David Cameron personally appointed George Michael the driving safety czar <laughs> and Nick Clegg the deputy prime minister. <laughs> Commenting on Sir Philip Green's handling of the BHS pension fund, Alistair Campbell said it had a whiff of the Robert Maxwells. Well, Sir Philip, you've got a yacht, you know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Ian and Diane, take a look at this. The uh, presidential visit. Ah, oh, that's the propaganda. Good grief, that's a selfie. <laughs> <laughs> And that's flaky. <laughs> we had a visit by an American president, which was incredibly exciting. Um, he... <laughs> it was! <laughs> he played golf, which is important on a state visit, and he ate two enormous meals with the royal family. And he advised us to stay in the EU. No, it was a threat. He said, unless you stay in the EU, you'll go to the back of the queue which is a mistake with British people, because we think, great, <coughs> Q. <laughs> I'll go back again and Q up. <laughs> this but is good. Are these EU-US trade deals as exciting as they sound? I am gripped. <laughs> I can barely sleep at night going over the details. <laughs> One being negotiated at the moment, isn't there, called the Transatlantic Trade and Investment mm -hmm. Partnership? Or... Yeah, which Obama said, you know, if, if you don't stay in the EU, you don't get this brilliant deal, which is a terrible deal, which half of Europe is trying to throw out. 
It's basically a deal that allows corporate America to do what it likes. <laughs> Having a go at Obama, it's very popular. <laughs> <laughs> what did the Brexit camp make of his intervention in support of staying in the EU? Were they pleased? No, they were jolly cross. They were jolly cross. <laughs> because all they've got is Marine Le Pen. <laughs> What did Jeremy Corbyn discuss with Obama during the 30 sparse minutes that he got to spend with him, do you know? I think it was global capitalism and the effect on the labour market. That's not far off, because the subject of their half-hour discussion was post-industrial societies and the power of global corporations and the increasing use of technology around the world. <laughs> well, in camera and a round of golf. Well, I think by the time Corbyn had actually said that, his time was up, so... Um... <laughs> Um, yes, the round of golf, that was next on his agenda. This took place just outside Watford. Um, the President's retinue blended into its surroundings. Here's the usual convoy of Secret Service personnel. There they are. <laughs> and uh, here they are in golf course mode. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, David Cameron and uh, President Obama exchanged gifts. This is what Obama gave Cameron. A custom-made Shinola men's watch, engraved with the presidential seal. A bison leather duffel bag, monogrammed with the Prime Minister's initials. Three cans of US Open tennis balls. And a pair of sports towels, personalised with the UK-US friendship flags. Whatever they are. Sports towels? <laughs> it's an unsubtle message, isn't it? Yeah. It's get exercising, fatty. Yeah. <laughs> This is what David Cameron gave him. A volume of the complete works of Shakespeare. Oh, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing I was interested in was, uh, you know, Boris mentioned this uh, bust of Churchill. Oh, that's that right, Obama yes. Had, that apparently he claimed he had removed from his office. Yeah. But I'd be interested in having that if he's not if it's not for the bag. Because I've got a uh, Martin Luther King snow globe I could swap. <laughs> Do you know how Churchill's grandson Nicholas Soames reacted? Do you know he what he exploded. said? Yeah, he was angry. He thought Boris was out of order to take issue with its removal, saying he's really bogged it. <laughs> <laughs> bogged it. Bogged it. H has anyone here ever bogged it? <laughs> Well, let's take a little detour. How did Ken Livingstone bog it this week? <laughs> if I'm using it in the right context. He came out in defence of someone that the party have now suspended. Naz Shah, who's an MP, yeah. Naz Shah, who, yeah. who made some rather unfortunate um, anti-Semitic posts. But, um, as she said, it was, it was way back in 2014. <laughs> Which is, you know, a That's world away. It's like, like 1932. No, <laughs> the suggestion was that he said, apparently, that in 1932, Hitler was saying that he actually was a Zionist. He thought it was a jolly good idea that he wanted to ship all the Jews in Germany to Israel. But when you're making a speech saying that somebody else isn't an anti-Semite, it's best to keep the words Hitler and Jews <laughs> away from each other. <laughs> On the whole. How did Ken Livingstone avoid journalists after news of his suspension broke? He put on a pair of dungarees and went home. No, he actually did bog it because he, he took cover in a disabled toilet, which <laughs> I'm assuming is the meaning of bogging it. I don't know. There he is, nipping into one. And he was in there for 20 minutes while journalists shouted questions about Hitler at him. <laughs> I watched uh, him being chased up the stairs by Mr. Mann and being given a thumping, and he kept smiling. But it is something when you've got two Labour figures just screaming at each other. That footage is brilliant. Disgusting oh, racist. Oh, Rewriting history, you're a disgusting racist. You're saying it's not true? You're, yes, you're a lying racist. Really? Why don't you go and check A Nazi apologist. A Nazi apologist. A Nazi apologist. You're a disgusting Nazi apologist, Livingstone. Wow. It's a happy party. <laughs> He's got terribly long legs, you know. Who? Who? Ken Livingston. Ken Livingston. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. there I, he met him once. I met him. I met him. I said to him, You've got, long legs. You've got disproportionately <laughs> long legs. <laughs> and he, it's a true story. And he said, I know. 
He probably thought this is the weirdest chat up line I've ever had. <laughs> Disproportionately long you know, legs. Look at him next time. Yeah. Very long legs. I know that's true, actually. I met him. He does have long legs. Yeah. <laughs> Was that it? Was that what? All you thought? No, he gave me a mince pie. <laughs> this is Barack Obama's visit to the UK. David Cameron and Barack Obama enjoyed a round of golf together, though even the presidential golf buggy had to be followed by a motorcade of secret service men. Still, they were on a golf course. That's an awful lot of grassy knolls. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, Ken Livingstone has been suspended from the Labour Party for attempting to defend Naz Shah's anti-Semitic comments. Livingstone said, let's remember that in 1932, Hitler's policy was that the Jews should be moved to Israel. Uh, this was before he went mad. I'm not sure whether that was Hitler or Ken. <laughs> Teams now, here's another one. Oh, yes, well, this is the uh, extraordinary story of Hillsborough. It's called McKenzie, editor of The Sun. Basically, people were demonised. Uh, football fans in the 1980s were seen as uh, hooligans who were drunk the whole time. There'd been lots of pitch invasions, so therefore you had these fences put up. Ken Bates, the Chelsea chairman, wanted to put up electrified fences, I remember. So this was how people sort of viewed football fans. I mean, the truth of the matter is that the, amongst these 96 people were working-class people, middle-class people, people from Liverpool, people outside of Liverpool. And it took 27 <coughs> years yeah. to come out. Which sort of makes Chilcot look fast. Yeah. <laughs> this is the news that the um, Hillsborough families had succeeded in their 27-year campaign. Uh, was celebrated on the front pages of the national press. The Guardian, the Mirror, yeah. the Star, the Eye, the Telegraph and the Sun. Absolutely no sign of Hillsborough there mm. at all. The fact that the Murdoch papers didn't run it because of their embarrassment about having run headlines that said the truth and then they got it all wrong and they just fed exactly what the police said to them. And then they stuck to that line for years. I mean, there was extraordinary collaboration to make sure there was one story put out. After the tragedy, 164 police statements submitted to the Justice Taylor Report were altered and most of the alterations were to remove criticism of the police operation and senior officers' lack of leadership. If you want to learn more about the findings of the Hillsborough inquest, you can read in-depth analysis on the BBC website, and if you want to know less, then read The Sun. <laughs> And so, to round two, the one-armed bandit of news. Fingers on buzzers, teams. <laughs> it's, uh, this is the astronaut in space, Tim Peake, is it? And uh, 26 miles, he ran round the, on, a, on a little sort of space thing there. Do you mean a treadmill? Treadmill. No. But actually, if he stands still, he does more than 26 miles. He's orbiting the Earth, so he's a fool for himself. <laughs> uh, yeah, he ran... <laughs> He ran the marathon because the cameras were on him and he ran and ran and ran and everybody was very happy at the end. That's <laughs> nothing compared to you, is it? A marathon? No. You did how many? 135 miles. Yeah, just like that. And in not an even hour. in space. In an hour. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> oh, all right. <laughs> Were well, you parachuting out of a plane? <laughs> Seven days. So, Seven days. So, yes. You had sticks. <laughs> I had sticks. <laughs> I saw you with the sticks. Oh, yeah, I know. But... Are they helpful? Uh, they are quite helpful, but I didn't really use them very much because they make you look like a twat. <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> no, they really do. Yeah. You think, like, people think, is she skiing? There's no snow. What is she doing? It does look... You might have been approaching a giant Chinese meal. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, Tim Peake, he broke a world record for running a marathon in space. Was he dressed up? <laughs> Tim P. He seems like he's showing off, really. You know, he's already in space. Why run a marathon? Yeah, yeah you're right. How do you even run a marathon in zero gravity? He was strapped down so he didn't float away. Oh, right. You okay. must leave the window open. <laughs> Peak was strapped to the treadmill, that's right. They strapped me to the treadmill, Did but they? that's because I kept trying to get away. <laughs> Back down here on Earth, who slightly undermined Tim's incredible achievement? All those other people in the marathon. 
Well, yeah, well, there was one man called Martin Hewlett who set the Guinness World Record for the fastest Earth marathon dressed as an astronaut. <laughs> um, running in a costume that can be dangerously dehydrating. Here he is before the race. That's him in the middle. And uh, here he is after finishing. <laughs> <laughs> Although, um, I think in terms of suffering, I'm not sure uh, anyone beats this guy. <laughs> I know what you're thinking, but don't worry. A bloke dressed as Simon of Cyrene came and took it off him soon after that. <laughs> Have I got my Bible facts right there, Ian? Terrific. Thank Great to hear you. a Simon of Cyrene joke. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Very few for about 2,000 years. <laughs> Simon of Serini walks into a pub and says, Oh, I'll take a pint off you. <laughs> Why did this lady, yes. Betty Barker, think Tim Peake was drunk last Christmas Eve? Um, she worked in his local pub. He came in, he said, I'm going, I'm going to the space next year. <laughs> he called her from the space station yeah. by mistake after getting the wrong number on his space phone when he was trying to call home. Oh. She um, was lucky there was a photographer there to capture the moment. <laughs> <laughs> she... Well, Betty Barker thought he was a drunken reveller looking for a good time. <laughs> She's optimistic, old <laughs> Becky Bug, isn't she? And she said, he just said, hello, is that planet Earth? So I said, no, which I suppose is technically incorrect. <laughs> and she said, I thought it was someone looking to go to a nightclub called Planet Earth. So I hung up. It's quite picky. It is a bit. Extraterrestrials may have been trying to contact us for decades. <laughs> Well, they Betty, speak to the wrong people. Betty yeah. Barker Betty fucked Barker. it up. Anyway, um, <laughs> finally, shall we see how Tim Peake is inspiring a nation of youngsters to reach for the stars? Absolutely. Here we go. You look like an astronaut. Are you going to be an astronaut? No. <laughs> <laughs> OK, time now for the odd one out round. Mm. You're for our spelling test for school children. Bernie Clifton's new album, mm -hmm. The Sinner's Bible, and the village of Melathiru Venkata Nathapuram in India. <laughs> that's a. Uh, that's... <laughs> Thank you. Is that the place that's got a railway station where they say we're here? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, spelling test. Was there something the other week about the, some kids have been given a spelling test that they've already seen? And the real test happened to be exactly the same. Was that the story? Was that, uh, yeah. That's that. Okay. So, uh, the Sinner's Bible. Um, that was an early Bible where it had a misprint yes. in it. Oh, yeah. And instead of, in the Ten Commandments, instead of saying, Thou shalt uh, not kill, they'd left the not out. And yes. I think it was, was it kill or adultery? It was adultery. It was adultery. That's why people got excited because uh, <laughs> it said, Thou shalt cock commit. Up, then. <laughs> <laughs> Did you say Bernie Clifton's got a new album out? Yes, you... he has. And what's interesting? They printed the songs of a death metal band <laughs> instead of his own titles. There must be a spelling mistake in the name of that town, then. I think I got it. The test for the children because it's been changed. That's the other one out. That is the right answer. Mm. In all the other three cases, mm. Mm. Um, there have there been... Mis a misprint, yes, a mistake. That's right. Whereas Absolutely. with this town, they've got it completely right. No, no. No, not with <laughs> I said that Paula got it right. No, I said that Paula got the oh, answer right. So, yes, yeah, so, but between you, you've got it. So, one yes. point each, I think. Lovely. They've all featured misprints, yes. except the spelling test for UK seven-year-olds, which appeared online correctly before um, the exam uh, took place. Do you know how the error was discovered? Somebody spotted it. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. A primary school teacher noticed that during Wednesday's test, one of the children appeared to know the spellings that were being read out. <laughs> <laughs> one would hope that at least one of them would. <laughs> Where do they get this knowledge from? <laughs> <laughs> and we've already mentioned the mix-up that the launch mm. of veteran entertainer Bernie Clifton's new album... Can you explain why he's on an ostrich? <laughs> that, that was his act. Those aren't his legs. No. No, don't give it away. <laughs> 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 the magic is spilling out. <laughs> You're making me feel stupid now. <laughs> Um, Bernie's album has been misprinted with a track listing, as you said, of the new album belonging to death metal band Abhorrent Decimation. <laughs> <laughs> Which 
cheery Bernie Clifton said, my act has never been described as abhorrent decimation. <laughs> well, not your face, mate. <laughs> um, Bernie's trying to relaunch his career, but with one big difference. What is it? He's not doing the ostrich anymore? That's right, he's ditched it. Really? Mm. And he says this, the bird has only ever been 5% of what I do, but TV only ever wanted the bird. <laughs> But you kept giving it to them, Bernie, you whore. <laughs> <laughs> Time now for the Missing Words round, which this week features, as its guest publication, Deposits magazine. <laughs> the magazine of rocks, fossils and geology, which, when it comes to its own content, can't always make its mind up. Interesting borings. <laughs> um, and we start with optimistic man fails to what? Not Keith Chegwin's confidence. <laughs> <laughs> Optimistic man fails to reach Bermuda. This is the story of Reza Balushi, who attempted to walk across the ocean from Florida <laughs> to Bermuda in a large inflatable plastic bubble. After being rescued by the Coast Guard, Balushi popped the bubble and stepped out of it, saying, I feel like I've really let myself down. <laughs> Next, the dinosaurs what for no apparent reason? I think it's the dinosaurs died out, but I heard they dined out for no apparent reason. <laughs> uh, no, that it is in fact the dinosaurs ran away from Europe for no apparent reason. <laughs> Brexit. <laughs> exactly, the dinosaurs departure. Brexit. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Finally, man with giant foot what? Jokes. <laughs> is it? There's no nothing missing. Man with giant foot. <laughs> no, there is. It's man with giant foot yeah. issued with parking ticket. <laughs> a traffic warden in South London ticketed a giant foot that parked outside Ballam Tube Station. <laughs> Here's the traffic warden giving the foot a parking ticket. <laughs> To be fair, the foot had just broken down and it was waiting for a tow truck. <laughs> <laughs> so, the final scores are Paul and Nick have five, but Ian and Diane have seven. <laughs> But before we go, there's just time for the caption competition. <laughs> Bet you a quid I can lose my hand. <laughs> <laughs> Don't put your keys in me, I'm not a handbag yet. <laughs> <laughs> On which note, yeah. we say thank you to our panellists, Ian Hislop and Diane Morgan, Paul Merton and Nick Hewer, and I leave you with news that, after drastic budget cuts, it looks like the next Star Wars movie could be a little disappointing. <laughs> in Cambridge, a long-running feud in the council traffic department escalates to full-on civil war. <laughs> and in Glasgow, there's terror as the police are called in to identify a mysterious and suspicious package. <laughs> Good night. What laughs to come on a big day for the boomers next?